Shirewolves owe us lunch money, and we will be taking it at that event. Whitworth, the system, the clock, Harlock, none of these guys can get in front of my destiny. What's up, sweaties? You're gonna watch uh, Collider Heroes? Here we are, we're gonna talk about a lot of crazy stuff like Jake Gyllenhaal, Izzy Mysterio, Deadpool 2, we're gonna get spoilery with it, and then I talk to the Infinity War writers, Marcus Smith and McFeely today. Hey everybody, what's going on? Can't wait to get sweaty with y'all. Guess who's here? We got Burnett. It's good to be here. Did you have a good birthday weekend? Do you I, both have hey, good birthday weekends? We had a birthday week last week. That's right, myself, Robert Meyer Burnett, Amy Dallin, we had an amazing birthday. Not to leave Jeff May out, but it wasn't his birthday last week. No. But we said, hey, can you be on the show anyway? So. I, I did I did decide. This is my gift to you guys. Actually, thank you so much. I hope you like it. It's well, next, next week, I want to say thank you to uh, John Olson for sending us amazing T-shirts of... Us, us as like Doctor Strange, Moon Knight, and Squirrel Girl. We're gonna oh we're gonna God. wear those next week, and we're gonna put up those posters next week so you can check them out. Thanks again, John Olson. Great birthday present. Thanks everybody who came out to our little impromptu meet and greet. We just were like, hey, you know what? We're gonna go see Avengers and IMAX. Come and hang out with us and have some uh, you know fun and adventure at Panera. And so we got sweaty. <laughs> we hung out in a little kind of a big circle it's about 30 40 people showed up it was great so it was thank really you all nice. everybody really who came nice. out so people from uh las vegas and other you know, people from michigan stayed an extra couple days just to get sweaty with us really appreciate it it made us all feel like we're actually we do do something worthwhile here talking about superhero comic book movie things right guys people are listening yeah people are actually listening it was great too a very informed group of people Everybody was had a really fun time. You know what? I want to have a, a sad time and give a moment of silence to Margot Kidder. Now she passed away a couple of uh, like last week, May 18th, I believe it was. 13th. Uh, May 13th. Yeah. Thank you. And um, yeah, Margot Kidder. A lot of people know her from her Superman movies. Uh, I remember her in so many other films, like you know Brian De Palma's Sisters. I mean, she's a uh, she's Amityville Horror. Amityville Horror. So she she had a lot of great films. Obviously, we all know her as Lois Lane. So a moment of silence for Margot Kidder. And you know, if you want to remember her, check out Superman the movie or Superman Two. Those are the golden moments of. Lois Lane in her prime. Uh, you 40th know, anniversary. It, that's right. Get Check out Superman the movie. Check out Superman 2. Uh, which one is the 40th? It's Superman the Superman movie. Superman the movie. Yeah, I, I saw it theatrically with a bunch of the cast just uh, a month ago for the 40th anniversary. A lot of fun. It was like Nan was there. Uh, you know, the whole bunch of people were there. So um, it, was, it was cool. Uh, and it also stood up. Just seeing it in the theater, it's such a fantastic film. Give you do yourself a favor if you haven't seen Superman the movie, see it in as big a screen as possible. I mean, it's it, Richard Donner really did a good job. It, it's one of the first kind of superhero films that really broke the ice for the world that we live in now, the age of superheroes. Jake Gyllenhaal, guess what? That creepy dude from Nightcrawler, he's gonna be a villain in Spider-Man 2. Everyone's talking about Hollywood Reporter specifically is saying he's been cast as Quentin Beck, a la Mysterio, um, in the Spider-Man 2, whatever the hell it's called, uh, home friending, homecoming 2, whatever. The, it's Spider-Man 2, whatever the heck it's called. But Mysterio seems to be the main villain. We also have heard that obviously Michael Keaton will be returning. Unfortunately, he'll be in jail, but he shows back up as Tombs, you know, incarcerated. We also know that our friend the Scorpion is incarcerated with him. So guess what? I mean, what are your thoughts about Jake Gyllenhaal being cast to play Mysterio. Jeff, let's start I, with you. I like the idea that this is also, like all the news we're getting is setting up for like a Sinister Six. Uh, and I think he's a great actor. I think he's really, really fantastic. Uh, I think this is a good work for him because he can play that kind of smoky, creepy weirdo mm -hmm. that Mysterio has to be. And I like where they, the direction they can go in there. I think Doctor Strange kind of showed us what you can do with really warping reality and right. bending, bending everything going on. So I'm stoked on it. I'm, I'm totally for it. I'm here for it. Now, 
he's probably not going to be going sorcerer style. He'll be going textile. My guess is that he ends up making some kind of hookup with the tinkerer who allows him to help push his special effects trickery beyond the normal means. What are your thoughts about this? Well, this is interesting because I, I, first of all, I, I love Jake Gyllenhaal as an actor, so I have a feeling I'm really going to enjoy this. Uh, but it, like, we, we, I mean, we've guessed a million different things for the future of Spider-Man, but I feel like we actually talked about when they said that four would be setting up the future. We talked about like, what if Mysterio, mm -hmm. if he's reflecting on the Marvel universe, oh, yeah. and if things have changed, then the power of illusions is going to be especially resonant. And it's also great because you need like it shows off the strength of Spider-Man's Rogues Gallery for me because a variety of challenges that don't just consist of punching things, yep. um, which will really test. Like, I'm poor Tom Holland uh, in whatever form we have him uh, <laughs> by the time that movie rolls around. So I'm, I'm excited about this. Definitely. What do you think? Well, I don't understand how they're going to make a movie with Mysterio when Spider-Man's gone. <laughs> Spoilers, guys, just in case you haven't seen everyone, everyone on the planet has seen Avengers Infinity War and cried at the end. Why but does everybody you know think Spider-Man's going to come back? Hey, look, why do Did you think that Spider-Man Spider two doesn't take place a year before F Avengers Infinity War? It could just be his second year in we high school. We don't even know that he's playing. Play. Has that it been announced so he's playing Spider-Man? Uh, uh, it is Tom Holland. He is going to be Spider-Man, but we don't know what year it takes. Can joking. I give a special shout out to, if you are not following Gail Simone on Twitter, you are missing out. She just uh, went and told a story from Puerto Rico Comic Con, which was this weekend. She told this story on her Twitter of that she was seated next to Jim Starland and a little boy came up and went, who's that next to you? And she went, oh, well, that's Jim Starlin. He said, what did he do? And she said, he created Thanos. And uh, now that we're in spoiler territory, the, <laughs> the kid went, what? I don't want to talk to him. He killed Spider-Man. Oh, man. And left. <laughs> and well, I'm no. a little sad for well, Starlin, but it's the cutest thing in the lots universe. Lots of kids, uh, you know, 10 and under, maybe 10 and over, were crying at the end of Infinity War. In fact, a lot of emotional tears were spent. Thanks a lot, Mark McFeely. Yeah. We're going to talk to you in a minute, but let's let's uh, let's move well, wait, on. Wait, I love Mysterio. Yeah, I want to say I'm very excited. We've talked about Mysterio for many many episodes, <laughs> hoping and praying that Spider-Man would eventually. We knew Spider-Man, like you know, Bruce Campbell might show up in the Sam Raimi as Mysterio if they did the Spider-Man four, but. Uh, you know, I want to see that fishbowl head. At least he should have like a Mark One, like a Iron Man Mark One version, <laughs> yeah. yes. where Spider Man just cracks his, and then he like has to go and like retool his, you know, toolbox. Maybe he hooks up with the Tinker and gets a newer outfit. But I want to see that traditional Steve Ditko giant fishbowl head with the weird purple in you know, a weird gauntlets. Super <laughs> cool design. You know, what do you guys think? Do you want to see the fishbowl? Yes. Yes. Yeah, of course. All right, so we're all in agreement. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to see that? Fish bowl or die. Um, that's a brand new T-shirt. You can get it on uh, T Public, I guess. Batwoman <laughs> comes to the CWDC universe. That's right. So Stephen Amell announced that Arrow will be fighting alongside Batwoman in a crossover that will be taking place towards the end of Arrow season. I believe six, six. or seven. I don't even know what season they're in now. It's like. They're the highest of, of all the seasons a lot of, of the seasons. CW Seven pals. Or eight next year. Now, the character Kate Kane was reintroduced in the DC's New 52 as the new Batwoman. Now, we know she was, you know, first showed up in the 50s as Batwoman. I think she had like a weird yellow outfit and it was like a different time and place. And I think you meant to say the series 52, not the new 52. D that's For what I meant. Yes. Along. Yeah, the, the new 52. Don't tweet yeah. John about it. He yeah. knows. <laughs> Just Amy already got me. Um, so she is uh, in the, the new incarnation. She is one of the most prominent LGBTQ characters in comic book history. Do you think they're going to keep that for Arrow? What do you think? Oh, that can't even be in question. <laughs> like, I, I assume that they know much better than to. Yes. Like, they, I assume they have chosen that character deliberately. She is extremely well established now. Uh, the, the, the run to read. Uh, for this is to start with uh, Batwoman Elegy. Greg Rucka wrote it. J.H. Williams drew it. Oh. Uh, they like that's that's where she got her own. It was actually in the pages of Detective Comics, but it's collected as Batwoman. Right. Um, that's the place to start. She's a wonderful character. I'm so excited about this the, like this particular avenue into the Batman universe because it's just been sitting there and no one's been doing anything with right. this wonderful yeah. character. Doing absolutely nothing. Now they're also adding Gotham City. The city itself, Gotham City, finally acknowledging it, um, said, well, CW's Mark Pedowitz. So, the, so now we understand that Gotham season five is the final season for Fox. I think with that one going away, we're going to see Gotham City be introduced properly into not just the Arrowverse, but the whole CW universe, possibly even with Batwoman becoming a series. Because, you know, they do that little soft, like, hey, here's a little crossover, full series. What do you think, Jeff? I, I'm interested in it. I really am. And I'm also interested in sort of the end of Gotham into this. What are they going to do? Can you add Renee Montoya into mm. this? Like, what are the rights right. to that? Because that's such an important, she's such an important character 
in Batwoman's total uh, relation, obviously relationship, but like in her her run, the J. H. Williams and Greg Rucker run is probably one of the most gorgeous Beautiful. runs of comics I've I've ever seen. It's so fantastic. And you're right, Amy's 100 percent right. Like, how dumb would the CW be if they? erased her sexuality they will absolutely not like, yeah. i mean <laughs> no, first of all me being, no no no. i just wanted to bring it up to like iron that that point home because in the comic books she is incredibly important we already have some different characters in the cw universe who are multi-sexual who are lesbian or homosexual so i feel like it's totally already okay to have this character be introduced this way but to have her be the main character and have her own series, love it. especially done in the way that the comics have already established, that's what I'm really hoping, I'm really pulling for that. What do you think, Robert? I think it's great. I love this character too. I mean, it was a fairly recent addition to the DC universe. Yeah. I mean, last- By our standards, yes. Yes, by our standards. <laughs> I mean, and I, you know, I was very curious, when, cause, that, yeah. because it, you know, it's not, what I love about the representation aspect of this character is it's just matter of fact. Like it's not, it, it wasn't done in any kind of, of oh we're gonna hit you over the head, right. and which is I think a great way to do it. She's just she's just that's her character, and you can't. That's so intrinsic to who she is. You can't do it without that. I mean, that plus would be, Maggie Sawyer is already canon, so right. she's on Supergirl or and, has been. And yeah. you can't. I mean, I think that the 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 the, pro, the thing you have to remember with all these characters is the way they're adapted. The, the, the truer they are to the spirit of who the characters were, their inception, mm -hmm. the better off you're gonna be with, with the adaptations. That's why the MCU is so successful because they might not, the details are different, but the spirit of those characters is absolutely retained in, in the films. I think that's also why the Arrowverse is so successful as well. Yes. Like you say that like with, with the DCEU, the cinematic universe, you look at it and you're like, all right, whatever but with arrow they hit it like the flash is fun the way flash had been and like legends of tomorrow is a fun little like combination of these things and and i really like that that the Arrowverse really sort of hammers home the idea that like we have reverence for these characters but it's so dark it's so dark I like mean, the dc uh, universe <laughs> <laughs> i'm just uh, making a reference to deadpool 2 because let's get into the spoiler talk is. for deadpool oh. 2 so you know what, we've waited long enough. If you have not seen Deadpool 2 yet, just skip this section. I'm gonna wave my hands when we're done doing a spoiler for Deadpool 2 because we're gonna talk about all the little nit nitty, nit and gritty parts that made this film so much fun. Now, we talked about it in our non-spoiler review. I, I personally didn't like it as much as the first Deadpool. The first Deadpool, I think, is a, a far superior movie. Deadpool 2, though, does deliver in all these different areas except for the main story, at least for myself. Everything else, I laughed my ass off and I was very entertained. Ryan Reynolds is perfect to play this character. I want him to play Deadpool forever. I want him to do his low budget. He was saying, for Deadpool 3, I just like want a couple million bucks. I won't quote, don't quote me. I don't know how many millions he wants, but like a lower budget so we could just do a road movie. I think that's such a perfect idea because they already went, they did their big budget. Deadpool 2 is like a giant budget, super big action sequences. Now I just want to see it just jokes. I just want Ryan Reynolds breaking the fourth wall, hanging out with weirdo characters. But anyway, that's something different. Deadpool 2, let's talk about it. Your thoughts, let's start with you, Jeff. Your thoughts about Deadpool 2. Let's get right into spoilers. Your favorite and favorite scenes, worst scenes, go. Uh, my favorite scene is going to be a huge turnabout, uh, the heaven scene at the end. Because uh, that literally teared me up at the end. Aww. And I felt so mad and stupid that this dumb movie with a baby dick also had me just get, I was like, God, really, really Deadpool 2, you are making me tear up. I loved it. Um, I loved uh, the, the skydiving scene, I think for, <laughs> for action and comedy, because it also yes. peeks into the idea of what they showed you in the previews. Yes. Is they showed you X-Force in action, and then they did the parachute scene and you're like, ah, uh, gotcha. that's so funny. Yeah. Like, it was a big getcha, yeah. That is, that's great. I'm a huge, uh, I loved X-Force growing up. I, I stuck with it uh, all uh, to the end. Uh, and I- Shout out for your t-shirt, by the way. Oh, thank you, yeah. yeah. My it's ecstatic. a perfect Mike Allred. Though I do want to mention, no one told Mike Allred that uh, Zeitgeist, Zeitgeist was in the movie. Oh, he really? found out by seeing the film and tweeted pissed off. He was like, thanks for letting me know as a creator of a character that my, you're using my character didn't alert me to the character. I have to find out about it by seeing the movie. Yikes. So, hey, whoever's in charge of Fox, big F you for not, uh, not giving Mike Allred the proper respect for coming up with, in fact, coming up with the entire scene that that X-Force parachute scene is based on. It's based off the Peter Milligan, Mike Allred, X-Force number one 
one where Zeitgeist and the entire team all die on their first yeah. mission. So, so get with it, you scumbags, and properly yeah. credit the people who created the goddamn characters. So anyway, that's as much as I'll say, but Mike Allred should not be treated that way, and neither I, should Jim Starlin. Everyone needs to give these guys the proper due. I think at least Marvel has, has really done a, went out of their way to credit Jim Starlin in the Marvel movies, as far as him not getting his comics or whatever, you know, those are things that have to get sorted out with the comic book side of Marvel. Mm. But Marvel Studios has been like, look, we give everyone proper credit for all the characters that they actually created. So, you know, it's a, it gets to be a slippery slope, but look, let's not get that too much into it. Yeah. Sorry, I, yes, I somehow- Talking about the t-shirt, it set me off on a rant of I, anger. I missed that because Zeitgeist perked me up. Yeah. Like, and X-Force 116, the whole introduction to him, the immediate death, that, that I was, I didn't know that about the all, I somehow missed it. Twitter, but you, you I, ruined it for all, me. All of us who saw Zeitgeist, like I saw him in the trailer, and I was like, that's Zeitgeist. And then I knew right away when I saw that Zeitgeist was in it, they're gonna pull the fuck, they're gonna pull the wool. I was like, they're gonna kill everybody. You called that? I didn't say it up to anybody. No, but I was like, Zeitgeist would not, putting in my Zeitgeist would not be not introduced knowing, unless they were gonna do that. Because <laughs> yeah. he was like, he was one of those dumb characters. I spit acid, you're like, you're done. And I was like, wow, if they're doing that, wouldn't that be a, like that would be a coup yeah. if they did it. I thought for sure they would just kill Zeitgeist. I didn't think they were gonna kill everybody, just they, like X-Force in the original Cruz. first. So it's a, it was amazing <laughs> so to me. Fun. I think that's a, what do you think? What was well, your favorite scene? What was your worst scene? And it shows off some of the, some of the, like the things that work the most and least for me about these movies. One of the things that works most about it is the idea of getting all those people in on that joke of getting uh, the, like the, the wonderful actors that they got to play yeah. their version of X-Force to all go along with this. Like, I mean, it is a fantastic joke. It's, the, in some ways, like I will never 100% want these movies to be in canon because I am a diehard X-Men fan and I don't need Shatterstar to be dead. Right. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough line. Like I watch them with multiple sets of eyes. And there are, there's so much that works wonderfully in this movie. Like I, I, I walked in and I saw that photo and I just smiled in spite of myself because those three played their parts beautifully. I can watch more Domino forever. Cable, like, he may not have had the story that I know from Cable. There may be a lot of missing elements, but he's clearly Cable. Right. Uh, and there's so much potential going forward. There are other things where I wish that, like, there's been... So the plot line of uh, a guy's motivation being that his lady love gets shot is a... a we're going to go with classic... Uh, Tired, um, could be another Thing word. of storytelling. And, and there was a very interesting interview with the writers where somebody asked them about the concept of women in refrigerators, which is a fairly well-known phrase representing going to that well for your stories and it happening in comics, especially like in the 90s, it was sort of an explosion. And it's been 20 years of conversation about this. And the screenwriters, I, sort of to their credit, were open enough to say basically we hadn't heard of that and we didn't think about it. Uh, we hope that we did a good job with the handling of that storyline. And, right. and, and and there was a lot of, like, I, I'm still not sure where I come down on that, but it is interesting where if you are writing the parody of superhero movies, I feel like you should have heard of that. Yes. You Like, yeah. if you're smart about so many other things, make sure you're smart about all of the yeah. tropes that you're using. I gotta say, I mean, I, before the show, me and Jeff were talking about it, and I was like, hey, I respect your opinion because I hated that part. That Those are the parts that I hated was the scenes with him going through the, you know, first of all, the visual, I'd seen that already, like going with the water, and then uh, it, it was just kind of played out to me in a certain sense. Uh, and I didn't emotionally connect with it. It just was like, what, is she just gonna be watching TV, waiting for him to show up? It was just, it was so dumb to me that, uh, to me, I hated it, but it was good to that, on the, the exact flip side, final that's what I mean, I it, really, yeah. it really like, worked. So it, that's what I mean, it's, it's so, di people see films in such different ways that it's like, I'm never saying I'm right. It's just like, I'm just saying, this is my opinion, just like your opinion, all of us are right in our opinions. It was, I wasn't expecting it, was, which is really yeah. like, I wasn't expecting something, because that, that one part, and you're right, on a macro scale, the, the whole woman in the refrigerator, and shout out to Gail well, it's Simone. Not like we can never use who, that, that, yeah. that trope again. It's just something that you should maybe be aware of. Yeah. Like, right, because they could have played yeah, with it. They could have played with it better if they were aware of it to subvert it. What do you think, Robert? Well, you know, I I didn't like the movie as much as I hoped I would. Mm -hmm. I, I thought the humor was great. I love what we've already discussed about how X-Force gets killed. And <laughs> I, I thought to, what I loved about the first Deadpool was 
Even the action scene on the bridge, which they kept going in and out of, I thought that the actual story, the way that the story was told and unfolded, was almost as meta and almost as interesting, and uh, it was commenting on the action genre as a whole. Yeah. And so they and they subverted the action genre, and, and they made it. The action scenes were as funny as the jokes. I thought, and all the jokes in this film were funny. It it, it almost didn't need a plot. I would just. You know, I would just watch them riff and this stuff right. going on. But what I didn't like was the the action beats in this film. All the action seemed ordinary. Like there was nothing unexpected about, okay, it's a car chase or okay. But the car chase, there wasn't anything Deadpool about the car chase itself, right. if that makes any sense. It was like they hired a guy who does really good action choreography and that's what he did because that's what they did. They hired a guy really. So all the action choreography to me was like, it, oh, those are cool shots and it's cool cuts, but it, it felt empty to me because I didn't care about the story. I so that like, was like, my problem. Like even the beginning of the, the first Deadpool when the car is spinning end over end and the, it's all in, all the stuff, the detritus Did I forget the car. to turn off the, you know, the oven? So. Uh, I mean, all that stuff was hilarious. I mean, I'd never seen anything like that before. That was a really interesting spin on a car crash or whatever. Yeah. And this didn't have any of that in the film, you know, and, and, and the standard, and I felt that Cable... I love Josh Brolin as Cable, but who was he? You don't know anything about his techno-organic Looper, Looper meets T2. Yeah, That's you, what it you was. You really yeah. know so nothing about Cable as a character. Like, okay, his wife and child are dead, but you, <laughs> you don't know anything about him. Like, where is he from? What is he doing? Right. How does he travel? What is the time? future that he is in? Uh, I, I Who mean, are his wife? I love the, I, like, the fact, I, I never thought this through, but now that we are in 2018 and he's from the future and complaining about our generation, he's a cranky millennial, and I love that. Nah, that's right. <laughs> and also I felt Domino, too. Like they, they, I really felt I wanted to see, like when, whenever you're building a team, mm -hmm. if they had gone to get these characters and, and to meet with them somewhere so you could get a little bit of a flavor, like mm -hmm. I wanted to see Shatterstar do something you know, do That's something. That's why it's so funny, though, because he yeah. did nothing. Yeah, I, I, I like that they even lied to us in the credit. The, yeah. The, they showed him doing stuff, or they showed, you know, all the characters, they had a little action beat. Yeah. Like Brad Pitt as the Vanisher. Let's talk oh about God, some of these. Oh, my God. So funny. That I mean, was so, so funny. Like, you know, say what you will about the story, which I thought was pretty weak, and that was my down points for it. All my up points were why I ended up actually liking the film, which is just the little cameos, the little bits, every single little quip that Ryan Reynolds would say, like Black, Black Widow, just all of his little jokes. <laughs> Even the dubstep joke, which was, I thought was played out and dumb, kind of worked. The yeah. entire end credit sequence was better than the whole film, in my eyes. Oh, I was like, was those funny. last, like, whatever, three minutes or whatever, where those, hey, do you mind if I use this time travel thing? And then oh my just, God. it could have kept going, <laughs> and I wish it did. It was, it was, it was just literally everything I would have wanted them to do. Right. So that's why it was so fantastic. It was like, they're, now they're really, oh, wait, the movie's over. Like, they're really doing it. They, they, it showed you the possibilities. Oh, and Negasonic and Yukio were wonderful, and I forgot yeah. to mention that. They, like, you know, they didn't have a lot to do, but, like, thanks for existing. You guys are great. Yeah. Sure. I, well, again, but that's a, a, an instance where I would love to have seen more. But like, what would I you was, take away from How it? long did you want this? No, movie but I mean, to I was. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, they, look, if it, the Yukio joke, it was the same joke. She always was saying goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. I'm, I, it's because they adore each other. But I thought the, that was but, so funny. But, like, I, out of nowhere. I wanted more from that. They could have done a beat, you know, it's one, a comedy or. Baby legs? Comedy. V disturbing, strange, funny, basic instinct joke. Uh, we had the X Men cameo. That that okay, that was, that was unbelievable. That's what I'm saying. I'll just list off of you the, uh, you know, uh, Matt Damon cameo. Didn't even know it was Matt Damon. I had to find out about it wait, reading it later. So, wait, what? Who was Yeah, uh -huh. it's the guy at the trucks talking about the toilet paper. He's like, what you really want to do? Oh like, my God. That's he so was funny. the bigger guy. He was in full makeup and a beard. That was Matt Damon. That's. Um, wait, did I see Alan Tudyk in the credits for he's that? Also, yeah, yeah. He that's was, insane. Yeah, they're yeah. both. That's oh, that was Damon. Alan Oh, and, and, uh, okay. and Matt Damon. Um, the amazing. Black Tom bit was one of the funniest things because at first I was like, oh my God, Black Tom. And also, funny, Black Tom and Juggernaut are famously best friends right. in the comics. Uh, and we're in the Deadpool, um, the Joe Metarira, I believe it was Joe Kelly that wrote it, run. Uh, like they were in it. And then you see the black, and then like the confusing him with being actually black and then having him murdered, calling him a racist and the racism bit with Cable. Like yeah. that running joke to me was infinitely funnier. Like baby legs was fine as a joke, mm -hmm. but it went a little too long oh, and yeah. sort of just was like, remember when the baby hand thing was funny? Right. We're gonna do that with legs yes. now. 
where that's so I agree there was a lot sequels. there's a lot of repeat stuff where it was like hey remember that let's stretch that part out a little bit but you know I mean I gotta say Ryan Reynolds is the force behind Deadpool 2 and that's why even like you could have the worst storyline the worst script ever and he would make every single scene funny because he's peppering in these jokes unfortunately I felt a little bit it was like so post-production heavy where hey let's add this joke let's add that joke because the movie itself wasn't really working so I started to feel that a little bit you know I'm coming down harsh on the film in a certain sense but I was like I wanted it to be better than what it was it's still a good film it's still incredibly entertaining I laughed my ass off did I feel like oh my god I, that was incredible like the first film no, I just felt like, hey, was it a good sequel? Yes. I mean, any other comments? Well, I think that, that you know, you, you made a good point about how the jokes, I too felt a lot of jokes were added in post-production, like one-liners and yeah. singers. And, but there's so much in the film that is earned that is really funny. Like that one shot where it's not just one X-Man. Mm -hmm. It's like they clearly- They got the whole cast. They probably were shooting something that was probably shot on the set of Dark Phoenix. They had all the cast together. And that was hilarious. Those kinds of- that is smarter humor to me. And I thought the first Deadpool had a lot more of that. Yeah. And there was a lot more of, I, I thought, easy and- It wasn't as witty or smart as the first film. So right. I feel like this film was like dumbed down a little bit. It's wildly are, entertaining. Yeah. They're struggling with the sort of this, like this question of these movies and heart and kind of a moral center, right. which like, it's what they're explicitly fighting about in the movie, but they do struggle a little bit with playing it out, where it's like, I want to invest in the challenges, but you also want to gleefully murder people, and it's very difficult to make that work. Yeah. Uh, and and it, you know, a lot a lot of it worked, but there are other times. Juggernaut where didn't work at all for me. It was like a giant CG character. A lot of people were comparing him to Steppenwolf. I would say yes, it was like a Steppenwolf. It was a big misstep for that film. I kind of enjoyed looking I, at him just because he looked like Juggernaut. Yeah, he, I, he looked good. What my my big problem was his demise really focuses on the comedic problem of. How how do you make potty humor clever? Mm. Because it's so base and we it's not- We all coming. I know, it's like, it's really, it's kind of weak versus the part where once Colossus starts swearing, then he like does it again later as like a, like a I'm so naughty now and he right. calls him fuck or not. Like that to me is a much better joke than stuffing a, a, an electric cable up Juggernaut's bare right, ass. Right, because you're like, like one is based on the character, yeah, and one is not. It's just based on. It's not a well written and finish. That's a thing for me where I'm like, I'm not sure whether that's a valid complaint for me to have about this movie or just it being a Deadpool movie, and I need to remember that like I am not necessarily always like that joke is not for me. Well, no, I mean, but that's the thing. It rides that line, and sometimes it's like you know I found myself not emotionally invested in it. Not like the first movie was like a super emotionally investing either. It was just a better told story. That's, a, that's how I feel about it. Where it's like, look, you know, it's like Deadpool 2 is great. It's fun. Does it, does it beat the first film? At least not for me, but it, would I highly recommend it? Yeah, if you wanna laugh your ass off, it's like there's jokes a mile a minute and Deadpool, just Ryan Reynolds is inherently funny. So uh, what do you guys think about the Disney takeover? Is X-Force gonna happen? Cause they re literally are running out of time, but we do know that Drew Goddard <laughs> has a script. He's gonna direct it. They just need to sign off on it. Isn't it just a thing like Ryan Reynolds just was like, look dude, we just made $125 million in like three and a half days. I mean, $300 million dollars globally in three and a half days uh let's just make this sequel right now like start building sets next week can't don't you think that fox would not be stupid enough to like look we're literally throwing away another 500 to billion a billion dollars before this disney merger happens let's make x-force i really think that they should just move on it what do you think robert well you know how Hollywood doesn't work that I way. Know, there's there's, there's going to be executives sitting. I, there was a think piece. I saw somebody tweet it. I didn't read it. That said that the $125 million opening for Deadpool means there's finally superhero fatigue setting in. And I was like, what? Wow. Are you kidding me? Like, on what world do we live in that where that's not a, a great opening? Look, it's the doors. It's not the guns. What we need to do is have less oh, doors. Yes. We live yeah. on, it's idiocracy, only it's not funny. No, and I, I think, look, like you said, if a movie is successful, I've never understood if they're going to make a sequel, why they don't just green light these things after Immediately. the first Immediately. Immediately. Why not? Immediately, like today. Well, I mean, make sure it's ready. Yeah. It is. Don't, the only, don't everyone's everyone's saying Drew Goddard's script is great. 
The only Simon Kinberg was like, I need to have a few little things on it, whatever. It's like, just get it going, get start building sets. I feel like even if the Marvel takeover does happen, like Marvel's not dumb. If something's gonna make them seven hundred million dollars, they might be like, just make the goddamn movie. Like, it's that's a tough one I though, mean, dude. When you put a Disney brand on that, that's not gonna be rated R, and you're never gonna have baby legs. You're never gonna have the <clears throat> juggernaut jokes. You're not gonna have. It just is not gonna happen. Like I know yeah, they had touchstone pictures back in the '80s. We don't live in the '80s anymore. There, if they do use Fox to have their R-rated film films and keep it completely 100% separate from Disney, then yes, but they're not gonna do that. The whole reason they wanna buy Fox is so they can have that entire library on their Disney streaming service. It, granted though, their entire library has hard R rated stuff. So what is their streaming service gonna consist of? Really hard to tell. Is it gonna be different things like this, the adult version, this, the kids version, the, all, the family version? Well, even on home video, it's hard to get Touchstone movies like Ruthless Pe or Hollywood Pictures movies like Ruthless People. Sure. I just bought Consenting Adults, the Kevin Spacey uh, uh, film that. That's uh, ironic. Uh, yeah, I, I know. Consenting Woo! Adults. Well, that didn't come out as a Disney film. Well, he plays the bad guy. He's a horrible bad guy. Who gets In killed. life, too. He, he gets killed. But, spoiler alert. But, Too uh, late. You I enjoy the director. It. Are we done with You're Deadpool supposed to do. Spoilers? Hey, we're done with the spoilers. Oh. Hey, you know what? We've been talking about Deadpool too. If you haven't seen it, see the film. Come back and check out what we've been talking about. But next, we're going to talk with Marcus and McFeely. That's right, Christopher Marcus, Stephen, Stephen McFeely. We're in studio. Uh, let's talk to them. Uh, I'll throw it to you, Schnepp. Do a good job. Thanks for throwing to me, Schnepp. Now keep your day job. Hey, what's up, guys? Thanks for being on the show. Uh, nice to be here. Pleasure. Marcus and McFeely, the triumphant return with Avengers Infinity War. How do you do it? This is your sixth Marvel film. Every single one keeps getting better. What's your process? Uh, geez, love, There's a lot love of panic. sitting in a room yeah. going, uh, I don't think we have a movie. I don't think we have a movie. <laughs> and then eventually, I guess that's a movie. Kind of well, Avengers Infinity War is quite a film. It's two mm. hours plus. It's like two and a half hours. Yep. Ends with the bad guy winning. This is a spoiler episode, just in case anyone was wondering. <laughs> um, how did you compress all of these elements from Infinity Gauntlet, all these different character storylines that have been part of the MCU for all these years, 10 years plus now, into this film? Yeah, it's. Uh, it took us a while once we realized that we could make Thanos the main character, like literally the protagonist, mm -hmm. put him on a hero's journey. Um, things sort of slotted into place, and also, you know, we're getting a lot of um, blessing from Marvel when they say, "Yeah, it's okay <laughs> to make that guy the driver of the movie, to make, uh, to allow other characters that you've come to love to sort of take a back seat to that story." Um, once we settled on that, that's when we could tell just enough story for all the other characters to get us through this long process. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so how do you guys work together with the Russo brothers and Kevin Feige? Like you're kind of a five person, 10 hand team, or is it like, it's, no. what is it? I mean, we're kind of always in the room and then everyone else <laughs> enters right. as, as they're available. When they're feeding us, sometimes they'll visit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, look who it is. <laughs> so the gate, you're like that's literally in a prison right. slash fun filled that's food right. is delivered. Yes, that's right. it's, that's right. it's, you know how they make, uh, uh, is it pate? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it's like that. Well, it's like they come yeah. in and, and they always it's very act dark. Like, hey. That's a very dark. If you don't know how pate is made, Google it, then realize the darkness. <laughs> yeah. right. They always act act like we just <clears throat> dropped in. They're like, oh, hey, who, look who's in the building. When in reality, we've <laughs> been there never left. That's right. eternally. <laughs> uh, but yeah, sort of uh, uh, over the course of the last few years, uh, the Russo brothers and, and us, we've sort of become this little, Joe likes to call it a mini studio. Mm. Um, and that's kind of true, because these four movies that have sort of taken up the last five years of our lives um, have sort of never stopped. Uh, so that's us in a room, the brothers in the room, when they're not editing something, just trying to crack, in this case, two stories with everything on, on all the walls around us. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, I know we can't really talk about Avengers 4. We got a little less than a year to wait for that. That's less than what I had to deal with with Empire Strikes Back, but it has exactly. a similar flavor to it. The yeah. beeper for Captain Marvel is Luke getting his little hand back. You know, if that wasn't there, would it just been Vader like, ha ha? And then oh, 100%. Credits. We yeah. wanted so, that tag was important yeah, to you us. Need a little, yeah. Just Hope. So, yeah. Thanos, when you were writing Thanos, you yeah. realized he was going to be a fully CG character. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about that? I mean, because the Uncanny Valley, Thanos is the one that I feel broke it. I mean, it's yeah. he, he's finally the most realistic all CG character. Now, how was that? Was that working with Josh Brolin getting performance well, capture? How did when you were writing it, you knew it was going to be CG character? Yeah, I mean, we wrote it as a as a kid. We 
as a character, okay. as if you could hire Thanos, yeah. you know. Um, you know, 10,000 years ago when we wrote The Life and Death of Peter Sellers, we wrote it for Peter Sellers, and that was somebody else's problem is how, how they were right. going to cast him. Um, but there was a day when Dan DeLue and... Visual effects. Jen Underdahl said, come on, come on. <laughs> and we all sat in the room, and they turned on uh, just a little test of, of they'd had Josh for a few days, and it was... Really cool. Mind blowing, yeah. and it was that was the moment where we all went like, oh, like <clears throat> this, this is important. Remember, yeah. um, he'd been in uh, two other movies before, the, three other movies for a hair, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, we knew, you know, this just came down from Kevin. Like, uh, it's that's the kind of thing. Designing him is the kind of thing you can start before we ever write, because we know he's going to be all over the movie. So uh, we need to put as much uh, resource and attention into doing him as well as the apes get done in the Planet of the Apes movies. Sure. He'd never had that before. He's always like, oh, he might be in it. Now let's put this together or he's only in it for a shot. So, so much uh, depended on him and then people knew that and, and put and the attention And we also knew, you know, you had to love him as much as yeah. you, you know. Love's a strong I, word. Well, really. you had to <laughs> understand him and sympathize with him in some way. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, he's going to dominate the plots of two movies mm -hmm. in one way or another and it is if if you just got a guy who's angry right it's you know yeah it's it's it's, it's understanding the the villains uh believing that they're right yeah yeah well and again we made him the protagonist that, that better be a journey that you can at least kind of and it's also that's into. who thanos has become in the comics he's yeah. a he's he's his own hero of his own journey like there I finally, are Thanos comics. <laughs> yes, there are. Th there's yeah. a ton of Thanos comics. Uh, I finally believed that Thanos was bummed out when he killed his daughter when I saw it in IMAX. Because oh, I saw. Oh God. Okay. I finally saw. The, yeah. There's so much. Th there's so much to see in there. in this film. Just even the just the raw emotions where that that CG character is like emoting yeah. and reacting to what yeah. he just did. That kind of I still hate the guy. I can't wait yeah. for him to get his ass beat in Avengers Four. And so let's go into Even Avengers. Promises. Let's go into the end, where you dusted everybody, uh -huh. like half the half the crew. So we know Spider Man. The, I guess Spider Man Two is in his second year of high school before Avengers Four. No because he's dead. <laughs> but uh, so he, let's talk about like before and after the dusting. Like a lot of people yeah. have theories that all the characters who died before the dusting are dead or at least specifically there's a version of them like say vision is going to be like maybe the the west coast avengers vision now he's a ghosty and like i am a robot or whatever there's <laughs> you know he's not he's not going to be like the vision he's going to be like it's a part of him survived or something like I that right. but but gamora theories about her like a, a la in the comic book has you know maybe she's in the soul stone however but uh you know other characters like heimdall loki they're dead all the other people who got dusted, the people who are remaining are actually core original Avengers. So there's going to have to be some kind of sacrifice of some kind to bring back half the universe. Now, that's all spoilery if you say yes or no. All I'm saying is when you got to the, the who's got to go, who's got to stay, obviously it was like what you were saying is you got to pick and choose who you're going to give uh, preference to in each of the films. Yeah. What was that main decision for you? It's entirely salary based. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Can't right. afford That's right. those particular actors anymore. Right. Uh, so. It was, you're right. It, it, what story do we want to tell in four determined much of how that last scene played out. That's fair to say. Okay. Yeah. Um, moving forward, tell me who, do you like Kang? <laughs> Yeah, this is a character. Do I, I like yes. Kang? Sure. You mean like yes. with eggs? Yeah, the tasty drink, <laughs> Kang. Okay. So it's astronauts. Ooh, that's right. It. That's how we got to the moon. Um, <laughs> all right, maybe that's a tougher question. Uh, what about MODOK? Let's go. We, uh, we are on record. I, I personally love MODOK. <laughs> is there some way to get MODOK in one of these movies? Is Just there? a flashback scene? I think they're getting to the point where you've seen it like you couldn't float him down the hall in in winter soldier it was taking you out of the movie <laughs> right yeah. but you're getting to a point of goodwill where like yeah, maybe 
Sure. After Strange and Guardians in this one, yeah. like anything's kind of possible. Yeah, I feel like, you know, now that we're in the cosmic realm, yeah. especially of the 70s Marvel cosmic realm, mm -hmm. anything's possible. I, I could see a something, something cut to MODOK full That's frame. Right. Like, well, the, you know, no one would freak out. <laughs> no. It would be like, what? Everyone would just be like, Dip. you'd hear the eruption of the oh, audience yeah. screaming MODOK. Right. Well, there, MODOK, MODOK, MODOK. One of you us, could. one of you. Yeah. Well, no, I won't say. I won't say what I was about to say, which was. Uh, Please say it. Inappropriate, so don't. No, it's not inappropriate. Oh. It's a, it's, this is literally not a spoiler. It's just something that if you, for some reason you are having trouble, you future Marvel writer, I just think you have great heads that are available. You've always said. Uh, well, I thought Peter Dinklage would be great, but we've used him. Yeah. Right. Uh, you could take Zola. Oh, and that's somehow a good theory. Modoc. Yeah, Modoc oh, yeah. Him, yeah. Because Toby Jones has a great head. And he's the Arnim Zola Jack Kirby version is a little tiny. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, he's kind of got yeah, they're that. Not, they're, they're not dissimilar. Yeah, I'm not mad at that idea. Zola yeah. could be Modoc. He's like, in another form, you knew me as Zola. You know, <laughs> Zola, you know, whatever. Zodoc. <laughs> Zodoc. There we go. We heard it first. Breaking right. news. Zodoc. This, this is Avengers how blockbusters come to be. Um, last two questions for you guys. Thanos is a deviant. So you alluded to his father, who is mm. one of the Eternals. Yeah. Um, whether or not you guys were like straight yeah, yeah. up like, hey, we've already opened this door, because the door got opened in Guardians of the Galaxy with the Celestials. Sure. Mm -hmm. So little breadcrumbs have been getting chucked by mm -hmm. whoever decided to throw those in there, whether it was Gunn or Feige, were like, mm -hmm. and now Iger's talking about, like, hey, we've got this new thing happening, ba ba dee ba. How excited are you to see Jack Kirby's The Eternals come to life? Oh, right. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's a whole swath of stuff that's just sitting there completely insane that you can know. Uh, yeah, you've trained the audience, you know, that maybe it's much more palatable. We couldn't have done that yeah. in 2008. Right. Yeah. You've trained the audience. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I don't, and again, guys have trained is not a great word. <laughs> I just mean there's, there's, there's a whole bunch of fans now who know who Iron Man and Star-Lord are who didn't 10 years ago. Yeah. yeah. And that, that new Living Tribunal show is going to be amazing. Mm, the Living that, Tribunal show. Right. I will watch mm. every... Yeah, he's right. like the host. He's like, <laughs> I am the Living Tribunal. just turns. Yeah, that's right. What do you think, other side of my yeah. head? Yeah, that's well, a uh, contest deep, of champions following the... Yeah, it's like, after, <laughs> tune in after contest of champions. Right. The Living Tribunal. Sure. Um, last question. So what's next for you guys? You've just done the biggest movie of all time. You're the writers now, of the biggest movie fair, of all time. It's the fourth, fourth biggest fourth. movie of all time. Only fourth, right. John. And when we're done, I don't check. We're not done yet with this summer. <laughs> That's eh, good point. Eh, eh, eh. So James Cameron. you guys are, you know, you're in the catbird seat. You've been rocking these Marvel films. This, the fourth one is your sixth Marvel film. Yeah. yeah. Do you plan on on continuing with Marvel? Are there characters that you'd like to see come forth? Maybe that you're going to handle or or help? I mean, we. I will be perfectly honest in that we don't. We're not currently writing a Marvel movie. Right. Um, but there are plenty of characters that I think uh, you could do amazing things with. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, we love everybody at Marvel. Like, I mean, part of the reason why we stayed at Marvel so long is, you know, we're mm. so incredibly comfortable there. Yeah. So going back is, is a delightful concept. So. Yeah. But I mean, in the short term, we started a studio with the Russo brothers, so that's going to take up a lot of our time in the short term. Although we do have more work to do on Avengers Four, you know, to get it. Are you guys working on Deadly Class? No, uh, no, no. But that is the first thing out from the studio. Oh, right. Uh, Congratulations! Yeah, I'm looking forward yeah, to that. The trailer that's cool. was great. No, no. There's, there's Can a lot you of talk fun about what you're working on, or is that um, all the time? We are doing. We one thing we're working on is called Electric State that we have Andy Machete is uh, attached oh, nice. to direct. Yeah, and that's sort of a post-apocalyptic, weird post-apocalyptic story. And then there's a secret uh, rip from the headline story we're going to do. Nice. Yeah. Well, I'll be keeping my uh, my eyes open for any of that news. Thanks for being yeah. on the show. Thanks, Thank you, sir. And Marcus McFeely, guys, back to you, Schnapp. Thanks a lot, Schnapp. You did a good job talking to those idiots. Uh, those guys are great, by the way. John Schnapp's the idiot. Um, so, hey, you know, Marcus <laughs> and McFeely are one of the, the smartest writing teams that I could possibly imagine talking to. Now, they've done six Marvel films. They started with Captain America, the first Avenger. They did, obviously, Winter Soldier. They did rewrites on Thor The Dark World. A lot of people don't know. But there were a whole bunch mm -hmm. of people involved in that. Then they killed it with Civil War. Then they wrote Avengers Infinity War, which now we've seen. The, the biggest film, of all, not of all time yet, but it's making its way towards that. Um, and of course, we've got Avengers 4, which they've written. So. Is Kang going to be in Avengers 4? Mm. Robert, what do you think? I'd say, looking at that, yes. Amy? I have no idea, but that would be cool. 
What do you think, Jeff? I think it would be a good use of the character, to be honest. There's a lot you can do and undo with Kang. I mean, once you add time travel to the mix. Definitely. Now, I don't know if MODOK is going to show up. Yeah. You know, we were talking about, a little bit about MODOK. Love to see that character. MODOK stands for what again? Uh, is it mechanized organism designed only for killing or? Possibly mental. We haven't, we just, we have two different versions and I'm not sure. That's why you're on the show because <laughs> you know what MODOK stands for. That's why you're on the show. That's my new song. So, you know what? I want MODOK. I want Kang. They can get Kang. A lot of people were like, Fox owns those rights. Well, Amy had brought up, well, yeah, Rama Tut was, showed up in Fantastic Four, but that doesn't matter because Kang showed up his giant purple pumpkin head in Avengers 10. So yeah. literally, the Avengers own Kang, and they also love to drink Kang. It's one of the greatest drinks. You just add powder and water. Anyway, guys, <laughs> oh let's get God. into that comic book pull list. Right off the bat, we got the Black Hammer Age of Doom by Jeff Lemire and Dean Ormstein. We got Detective Comics 981 by James Tinian and uh, uh, Raul Fernandez. We got Star Wars 48, Kieran Gillen, just killing it with Salvador La Roca. I wanted to give a shout out because that's a great team. Uh, Black Panther number one, you got the return of Tanahisi Coates, Daniel Acuna, now it's Wakanda in space. And last but not least, Invincible Iron Man number 600. It is the last Marvel comics work of Brian Michael Bendis that we'll be reading possibly forever, maybe for a very long time. It's got art by Jim Chung, Mike Diodato Jr., oh, Chris geez. Sprouse, Lionel Yu, so many more artists. If you're not picking up Iron Man number 600, it doesn't matter if you didn't buy number 599, get this issue because it's gonna be important because Brian Michael Bendis is left Marvel, he's rocking onto DC. What are your guys thought about the pull list? Start with you, Jeff. Uh, I think that the Invincible Iron Man, uh, or uh, the Iron Man one, I think really is so big because it is a big send off for Bendis. But on top of that too, it's also opening up for what you're gonna get from Dan Slott. In, yes. writing, in writing Iron Man and, and sort of like what he did with Daredevil when it then shifted to Brubaker. Um, you you know that he's going to leave your character in some shit. Oh yeah. And and then like he le literally is gonna leave it and who better than to leave it to one of the greatest comics writers, in my opinion of all time with Dan Slott. So you have Bendis who was one of the great character writers, mm -hmm. uh, one a fantastic writer. And then to Slott who really is one of the few people I view as on a par. Uh, with Bendis in the Marvel canon. So I'm stoked on that to sort of see both how he's going to end his run, but then how he's going to open up somebody else's run. That's such a cool double shot for me. What do you, how about you, Amy? Uh, this is a great list. Uh, you should always be reading Black Hammer. Uh, James Tynan is wrapping up, I think, two years, almost 50 issues of Detective yes. Comics this wow. week yep. uh, as he moves on to Justice League Dark. Yep. Uh, and Which he's I got his Immortal Man going. Yes. Um, and, and so that that's very exciting. Uh, and, and Black Panther number one. Come on, get on it. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, th I think Forrest Whitaker was talking about Wakanda in space. I was like, what is he talking about? He's talking about this comic book. Mm -hmm. Like they're like they're always setting up the you know little kernels. They're dropping those breadcrumbs in the comics before they go out into the television or the movies. What do you think, Rob? Well, I, I'm Wakanda in space. I'm in. You know, I mean, I, great. But I also love Black Hammer. So, and go. definitely had some honorable mentions. Moon Knight 195, yeah, Rockstars, on. Rockstars number <laughs> nine, and The Beef number four. They can't all be in the top five. Let's move into Creators Corner, where I'm going to spotlight two creators who've got some crowdfunders that are up that I think are worthwhile. First off is Jesse Snyder talking about King of Kings. That's his new comic book. It's a weird twisted creation with himself and his twisted sister's dad, D. Snyder. You could go on uh, Indiegogo and check it out. There's a music video with D. Snyder as like one of these crazy, it's like gods versus gods. It's a pretty crazy and weird concept. I think it's worthwhile checking out. The second one is from Legion M. Now this is a, it's the first fan owned entertainment company uh, and they've got Mandy coming out. They've kind of come up and helped out with a lot of other films, independent films. So you can get a chance to become part of Legion M. If you go to their crowdfunder, it's wefunder.com, Legion M. I think it's a cool cause because it's actually letting people who are, who are creatives get a little part of the action. How it's all gonna work out right now, I don't really know. I know that you know whether or not they create this giant thing where I need a light stand. I don't know how it's all gonna work out, but I kind of, I wanna support it because I think it's a cool idea. Have you guys heard of King of Kings or Legion M? I, I mean, I've, I've heard about Legion M and some of the work that they've been doing. I haven't super checked it out, but they sound like really cool things. We'll definitely check those out. Let's get into minor mutations, starting with Deadpool 2. We got Deadpool 2 obviously making $125 million at the domestic. It didn't beat the first one, which was 132 
but who knows? It's an R-rated film making 125 million. Some people are calling that's a failure. What are you out of your mind? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, where did your 125 million slink off to? 300 million worldwide, and it's a failure. I don't even understand people. Yeah. Like, yeah, it is kind of a failure. It's indicative of the superhero malaise. Get the hell out of here. Anyway, what yeah. do you guys think about Deadpool 2 getting so much money for an R-rated film, and then weirdos complaining about it? What do you think, Amy? Well, it's. I, I was talking with someone, and I think this is done. I think Deadpool has done very well. I think there was potentially an alternate universe if Avengers had been disappointing. It could either have hurt or really helped Deadpool because we would all be desperate for like a laugh. Yes. Like if Avengers had sucked and taken itself way too seriously and like we'd all just been, it would either have kept people away or made it like break all known records because we just wanted something as a break. And instead they were both good and they both did what they set out to do. And it did, I think, very respectably. Definitely, Jeff. I think 125 million is a lot for any movie. Yeah. Like, let's be honest. That's, yeah. that's $1 it's million. a amount of money for three and a half yeah. days. It's <laughs> $1 million Crazy. for every arm that Cable broke in that movie. <laughs> That's right. And Avengers Infinity War still was able to gobble 26 million. They're like, mm, I'm still eating. That's more than most movies make in their, their entire run. Yeah. It made in a weekend. And it's like, whatever, fourth, fourth week of release. What do you think, Robert? Well, again, you, you can't expect everything to come out to top the next. Or, you know, not everything has to top what came before. This right. came really, really close. So it was a great investment. It paid off well. Yeah, the movie was probably a lot more expensive than the first one. Yeah. But that's okay. In the I, long run, I, this film is going to do quite well. I think and Deadpool 2 made more money in its opening weekend than The Mummy made in its entire run. But I want to mention the Dark Universe is not dead yet. That's right. The Mummy, even though it didn't make that much money, Tom Cruise is scrimping around as a mummy somewhere out there. Are we going to get Bride of Frankenstein? It seems like that might possibly happen. Bride of Frankenstein is still... Be locked down. They might have Angelina Jolie. They might have Bill Conan directing it. They've just been very quiet about it. They're like, yeah, yeah, we don't know what's happening with the Dark Universe. Don't look over at these weird pictures of people meeting about stuff. What's happening? So what do you guys think? Dark Universe, live or dead? It's, what do you think? Uh, limping along. I'm not sure. It, it, maybe it's alive now, but... My uh, I mean, I, I actually didn't realize they had those names on there. I haven't been paying attention to my right. Dark Universe news. But, like, if Bill Condon and Angelina Jolie want to get together and make a movie, I feel like that'll happen. Robert? Uh, yeah, but what they've got to do is not make some giant apocalyptic world-destroying film and concentrate instead on something like Shape of Water. Yes. You know, make a film that, that is intimate and... Look, don't put Real your universe intimate. before your character. I like what you said. That maybe they should consult that guy who just won the Oscar. Uh, you know, Guillermo. <laughs> yeah, but probably smart to consult with him. Jeff Johns is consulting Grant Morrison's Doom Patrol for their new series, Doom Patrol. And he says Beast Boy is going to be the focus in the Titans introduction of that team, which makes perfect sense. Are you excited about Doom Patrol, Jeff? I am. I am. I think anything Grant Morrison wrote that they're trying to adapt in any way is both going to be very difficult, but it could be very, very rewarding. And I love the idea that you would take something so trippy and insane like Doom Patrol and be like, you know what? Well, yeah, let's do that. Let's go. episode order. Uh, it's, it's insane to me. Yeah. And I, it, it's, it's almost like if you were to look anywhere 15 years ago, you'd be like, that isn't a thing. That's a fake news story in a future movie. Yes. It'd yeah, be it, in the back of Wizard Magazine where they'd be like, wouldn't it be cool if? And yeah. we'd be like, ha ha, never mind. It, it, it's almost exactly. like they reached into my wallet and took the money out when they said, <laughs> we just ordered 13 episodes of Doom Patrol. It's like, oh, the money just disappeared. Fans are trying to bring back the canceled series Lucifer. So now it made its run, it's got three seasons in the can and they cancel it. A lot of people are like doing these kinds of like, bring Lucifer back, what do you guys think about Lucifer? Uh, anytime we do these like, you need to bring the show back, I'm always like, you know, they lost money. Like that's why they canceled it, right? Like I always feel really bad. I'm sure it's a, a wonderful show, but yeah, fans are gonna wanna bring a thing back because they love the thing. Right. But that doesn't mean that it's a financially viable decision to make. Nobody okay. likes to be on the bubble. What do you think? I can't blame them for trying. I know like the the, the, the Brooklyn Nine-Nine corner of the internet was a beautiful thing to watch last week as right. they all yeah. simultaneously went from despair Quite a larger joy. fan community as well. Right. Um, and, and it, uh, like, so I, I, you know, I would be trying to, it's not my show, but like, you know, as long as you're respectful, uh, like let the people know what you want. Yeah. Hey, I, I'm all for people liking things. You know, if they want to try and bring back Lucifer, fine. I still want, you know, Lucifer is a spinoff really from Sandman. Yes. And I want a Sandman show. Oh, you're going to get a Sandman show. Believe me. It's in the works. We can't talk about it, but baby, it's happening. You know what? It was also happening. I zombie. 
a Mike Allred co-production, gets its fifth and final season alongside the uh, Gotham getting its fifth and final. I kind of like that when they re renew something and they're like, you're getting one final season and guess what, it's final. They're literally saying, this is the final season that you're gonna get. I think that it works, what do you think? I like it. I like that something from such a niche corner of the vertigo market yeah. is just showing up and just being like, here you go. It's, it's, it's clever, it's well done, it's beautifully shot, the show, and it's also beautifully drawn. They've, they've sort of adapted the all red insanity of, of the visuals into a very sh a show that's successful. Uh, I'm stoked on it. Good for them. It's, a, it's an interesting move because like, it, while it must be strange to work on something where you know no matter how good you make it, this is definitely the end, it also seems like a much saner alternative to the way TV writers describe literally not knowing as they're making something whether there will be more. Like That sounds like you would lose your mind. Yeah, totally. Robert? I'm all in. Yes. I Zombie, fifth season, it's coming. Just like Gotham, we don't know what's going to happen. Maybe Gotham's going to go to CW. Stan Lee was talking about Tom Holland just recently. He's like, this is exactly who I imagined when I was writing Spider-Man 50 years ago. That's my horrible Stan Lee impersonation. Um, Jeff, you had a good comeback on that. Dude, dude says that all the time. Like, yeah, Tom Holland's fantastic, but oh, he's who I had in mind. No, he's not. No, he's not. You just had any teenager in mind, and this is the teenager said now. about Tobey Maguire. Like, yeah, you said that about Andrew Tobey Garfield. Maguire. You said that about Andrew Let Garfield, the and that's fine. sweet about his creation. I think he's just saying that <laughs> Zeroka Sandbu, Jeff Let him Mace be Hayden. sweet about the creations that he kind of took from some other people. Bam! What do you think, Robert? Ooh, I, I kind of am with you. <laughs> I mean, I was actually on, a, on an old show in the 90s with Stan Lee who said on the show, it doesn't matter who plays Spider-Man because Spider-Man's in a mask. And I was like, what? <laughs> I told Stanley, I'm like, it's all about Peter Parker. And then he accused me from being from Krypton. There you go. I gotta find this, I've got this yeah. clip, I'm gonna put it up Aren't on Aren't we YouTube. all really from Krypton? Um, guess what, Scott Derrickson says, the ultimate Watchmen is his favorite superhero film ever. He's on, he's on point, because guess what? I think Ultimate Watchmen is a fantastic film. When you put it neck and neck with a lot of other comic book adaptations and how close they really got, I mean, literally I say uh, Rodriguez and, and Miller's Sin City is the comic book ripped from the page and that's mm -hmm. what you're watching. And very closely I could say that about Ultimate Watchmen, does it miss the heart of what Alan Moore his meta story about Super is what it was really supposed to be there. Did Snyder kind of bro out and misinterpret some of the deeper meanings of what Rorschach really meant? What did all of this really mean? I feel like it's a surface adapt adaptation really done really well. Like all the visuals, all the compositions, he did his research. Sometimes I feel like Snyder definitely, you know, you know, he talks the talk, but when you see the film, it's like, that's eh, it's not as deep as even you say it is. It's a little too bro style. So for myself, you know, um, but uh, do I love Watchmen, especially Ultimate Watchmen? Yes, I do. I think it's in a fantastic film. It's definitely in my personal top 10 of all superhero films of all time. What would you say about Ultimate Watchmen? Uh, here's one thing that uh, the comments are going to tear me apart for. I enjoy the ending, like the big sort of deus ex machina or whatever, mm. more in the movie than in the comics. That's okay. I think it's a better ending. And no I've squid. said this, I, th I think that the squid was lazy. It was an Outer Limits ripoff. The, even DC editorial was like, you sure you want to do the squid thing? And he was <laughs> like, yeah, I'm Alan Moore. I'll do what I want. Uh, <laughs> but like that, that ending I think is really good. I think it wraps it up a little different. Does he miss some of the tonal points? Yes, because it's not a comic book. And Watchmen is designed to be meta as a comic book. But in a way, as a movie, it's meta of a movie of a comic book and that I think is its own thing. I would right? argue I would argue that it's the 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 points I'm talking about had nothing to do with it being a comic book. I meant emotional oh. uh, what it meant it, what it missed for me at least emotionally when I read Rorschach's journal and Rorschach's journey, I felt like it was misinterpreted and kind of broed out a little bit. Same with Night Owl and um Silk Spectre. It, yeah, Silk Spectre. I think it missed some of the really important emotional story arcs and points, not from a comic book perspective, from a storytelling perspective. And I think Zack Snyder's exuberance to have an action scene or some ultra violence kind of diminished certain key yeah. parts for me personally. It's tough when you can't have a four hour movie. Well, it's but just, ultimate, I mean, ultimate Cut is three it's, it's plus. It's long, yeah, so. and, I, and I do like that. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, I think Jackie Earl Haley did a very, very fantastic. amazing job to add the emotion at the end during the do it scene. Oh yeah. I think it, it's, that one really gets me. I, I agree. It's. It's not the greatest movie, but man, I, don't, I can't picture anybody doing, and I hate saying this because I usually bump on Zack Snyder, but like 
he did a really good job. He did a fantastic job. What do this you think? This is a Amy? huge topic, uh, and I want to say so much about it. I will say, uh, like the you know the first whatever 10, 15 minutes of the movie are maybe literally perfect mm -hmm. uh, in a way that I did not ever expect to see realized on film. There are some performances within it that I find like successful beyond what I thought was possible. Like, I didn't think you could bring Rorschach to life in a way that did service both to his humanity and his ridiculousness, mm -hmm. and somehow they did it. Uh, there's other things that didn't work for me or that I tend to agree with you where I'm not sure, like, I'm not sure some of the, the deeper meanings and the, the character stuff came together uh, in, like, but I don't think that the complaint was that he tried to stay too close to the comics. I think you can do both. Uh, but that's, like, there's so much more to say about it. And if it inspired someone like Scott Derrickson to say, I can reach for stylized, I can reach yeah. for a departure from strict realism in order to get story across in an interesting way, if that helped us to get to Doctor Strange because he saw that was possible, fantastic. Yeah, I definitely say read what he had to say about uh, Ultimate Watchmen on Twitter. And I did want to echo like the squid had to be taken out because you had to take out the artist colony. You had to take out all these elements that are a 12 part miniseries. Yeah. We're going to get a chance to see HBO's new Watchmen adaptation. I'm sure it will not be based on the 1984 comic. I can bet you bottom dollar it's going to be set in our time now. It would be a smart take. Who knows? We'll find out soon. What are your thoughts about it? Well, I thought what you said was pretty astute. I think Watchmen is an interesting translation of the comic, but not a great adaptation. Because they have all these things. I am tickled to death, like you, watching the opening of, the opening with the comedian. It, it's perfect. But then it does things. I, I think the film has no depth. Like using, this is a, a thing that I think applies. I'm using this as an example, but I feel this about the whole film. The Vietnam sequence, when you see Dr. Manhattan in Vietnam and you, you see the comedian, they're, they're playing Ride of the Valkyries as the piece of music. Well, Ride of the Valkyries is so indelible to Apocalypse Now. Right. And it was a whole thing about they're playing Wagner and it, it, it was done in an ironic fashion. It, it's like then they decide to use that piece of music in that Vietnam scene, which to me undercuts the entire meaning of that, of that scene. It didn't, it didn't exist on its own. You're making a pop culture reference right. to another movie that's doing something weird and meta with music and i felt that way throughout the film using the sound of silence and when when the characters like when silk specter hooks up with night owl she's the, 10 years too young also but, which is not they, her fault right but they the, the idea of that putting on their costumes is the only way they can really feel alive and there's a, a lot it's touched on right but it's all very surface and the meaning of watchmen i think was lost yeah, I'm halfway there. Some of it, some of it he really, some of it really got, good. some of it he didn't. That said, I enjoy watching the film. Like, I put it on because I just love seeing that world come to life. And, it, like, there's so much of it that's right out of the comic. Yeah, and I, I, I can't remember if the ultimate cut is the same as the pirate edition. Is that the one with the animated stuff's cut in? No, there's so, extra yeah. stuff, like, at the newsstand. Right, but that's what I'm saying. Is that That's not the ultimate cut? I think it is. All right, so that I, that's the one I'm saying. It's a three-and-a-half-hour cut. Do yourself a favor and check it out. Yeah. The animation's a little wonky in the, you know, in the, the Black, Black Freighter, Freighter yeah. section. It's like... They should have spent another million bucks on it. Whatever. <laughs> it still works. And uh, definitely check that out. And that's been Heroes. So let me thank Burnett, Amy, Jeff May. See you next week. What's up, sweaties? It's John Schnapp here. Thanks for watching this episode of Collider Heroes. If you want to watch more episodes of Collider Heroes, you can click on any of these right here for more awesome shows from Collider. You can see comic book shopping. You can subscribe. Share this video. Share our videos. Tell your friends about it. Thanks for watching.